Today's podcast is brought to you by PageantSwag.com. If you're looking for fun and great fitting apparel specifically designed for the world of pageantry, this new online store is exactly that. Check it out today and use the promo code Life After the Crown for 10% off your first purchase. Again, that's PageantSwag.com. Hey, everybody, it is Miss South Carolina Teen USA 2007, Katie Upton, and you are listening to Life After the Crown with Tim Tialdo. Hey everybody, my name is Tim Tialdo, and welcome to Season 2 of the Life After the Crown podcast. Now, if you haven't had a chance to listen to any of the previous episodes, I do encourage you to go back and listen, because there are many valuable interviews that you will definitely gain some wisdom from. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, welcome and thanks for checking us out. Each episode of Life After the Crown, I interview former pageant contestants, title holders, and women of influence who share advice and stories on how to help you succeed in the world of pageants, but more importantly, how you can flourish in the professional world once your pageant journey comes to an end. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to download this podcast. I do value your time, and I'm glad you're here listening. So let's get started. My guest today was Miss South Carolina Teen USA 2007 and went on to place third runner-up at Miss Teen USA that year. And that pageant changed her life forever. She went from ordinary beauty queen to instant celebrity and pop culture icon when she stumbled on her top five question. Twelve years later and millions of YouTube hits later, she has turned her pageant gaffe into opportunity. She most recently is a franchise owner of F-45 Training Culver City in L.A., and at 27, she is one of the youngest F-45 gym owners in the world. In 2013, she hosted and starred in her own hilarious web series titled Learning Stuff with Katie Upton. It featured guest stars that included MMA champ Chris Cyborg and legendary skateboard and MTV star Rob Deerdeck. In 2015, she landed a lead hosting gig on Fox's Back Nine Network. Her show Off Par took an inventive look at the world of golf, lifestyle, and entertainment, but with a comedic twist. She has also appeared in numerous national commercials on Tosh.0 as a correspondent for Jimmy Kimmel Live and a contestant and finalist on CBS's award-winning competition series The Amazing Race, also as a guest co-host on MTV's Ridiculousness and in a recurring role on the HBO series Funny or Die. She has modeled for various successful campaigns including Bebe, Charlotte Roos, Strauss, Wrangler, Nautica, and many others. In 2010, she also shot her first Maxim spread and behind-the-scenes video for Maxim.com. She is a 2007 graduate of Lexington High School in South Carolina, where she starred as a soccer player and currently resides in Los Angeles. The one and only Katie Upton. Man, I have been trying to get you on for so long. It's so great to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. All right. Well, let's just get right to it and and get it out of the way because I I know you deal with it all the time. And I think, you know, now that you're physically talking to the pageant world as we speak, let's talk about the infamous question and the resulting answer. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so. Because uh, some uh, people out there in our nation don't have maps, and uh, I believe that our ed- education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Um, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries, so we will be able to build up our future for our. Children. Thank you very much, South Carolina. Uh, I know you've dealt with it. I know you've dealt with it for years. Um, <laughs> Twelve, to be exact. <laughs> exactly. Now, a, a, a stupid question would be, "What were you thinking?" But the, I think the more important question is, "How did you handle the fallout from you know?" Because I, I think, from what I can understand, I think you're probably the most recognized pageant contestant in history, based upon YouTube views okay. and, and just hits. So, how did you handle it? <laughs> um, so even though it was 12 years ago, don't get me wrong, it, 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 it's, it's a little difficult to remember everything because so much was happening at the time. 
and YouTube was uh, really was just getting popular. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way that I handled it was honestly based on my support system, my family, my friends. uh, And a lot of times I did get in my head and I I was put down and I was putting myself down and I just didn't allow myself to show it. And I think a lot of that had to do with me being an athlete growing up and fighting to win. And all I wanted to do was just prove people wrong and to show that that pageant doesn't define me and that question doesn't define me and that I am a normal person and I can speak coherent sentences. (laughs) 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 And uh, like after... After the fact, you know, I, I landed a couple of roles, like for TV hosting and The Amazing Race. That showed a different side to me that some people, if not a lot of people, were able to see, and that their opinions about me were able to change, and they because I was able to show myself more. Now, when you answered the question as you walked back yeah. in, into the line of the, the five girls that were in the finals, like, did you mm-hmm. did you realize what you just did? I mean, did you? What did you say? You know, we are speaking to the pageant world, so most pageant <laughs> people do know that there are two questions, whereas the rest of the world does not know that there are two questions usually. Um, and the first question I completely nailed, and I got to see my scores afterwards, and I was the clear winner. Like, I was picked to win. And uh, then the second person that came along, I being a non-pageant person in the first place in this time, this particular pageant being the first one where I ever had to do a two-question answer, I wasn't expecting to do a second answer or a second question, period. So whenever I was called back up, I just wasn't paying attention and I just assumed that we were just going to be chatting and like talking while the judges were finalizing their results. And so I, me being ADHD, I was just sending Mario Lopez out. I mean, who won it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I was just tuning everything out. And then all of a sudden I see this cute little blonde girl asking me this question. I'm like, oh my God, what did she just ask me? And I tried to put together a couple of the words and, you know, things kind of uh, went from there. And, uh, um, 12 years later, I'm sitting in LA and I've experienced all my experiences. <laughs> well, well you, you have certainly overcome a negative in a major way. And we're going to talk all about that during this hour. Um, when, when the pageant was over, um, at what point did you realize this was a big deal? You know, when the pageant was over, I didn't actually think it was a big deal for a couple of days because I just assumed like, oh, yeah, I definitely messed up a pageant question. I'm not going to win anymore, you know, even if I was the winner at the time or not. I wasn't sure because I hadn't seen the scores yet. Um, but I was like, I definitely am not going to win now. And I just kind of threw on my cocktail dress and I went to the after party thinking no big deal about it because it was just a pageant. And two days later, I didn't realize that people were making a big deal about it. And I was being compared to politicians and ignorance and all of that and how Americans are the stupidest people on the face of the planet. And I'm like, wow, how did a 17-year-old girl messing up a pageant question go and turn into America as the stupidest country in the entire world? So I almost, (laughs) that's what made me laugh so much about it because I was like, these people are comparing me to politicians and I'm a 17-year-old pageant girl who's never really done a pageant in her life like and yeah it's a big youtube hit like cool whatever but i didn't think two cents about it honestly well i think the good thing is that social media was not that prominent at that time i don't think it was quite oh god i can't even imagine today. if instagram was out <laughs> like know. i i with all my videos together there's like over 500 million views or something like that like i'd probably have more followers than freaking dang kylie jenner over yeah. here now yeah i think you've got quite a few <laughs> I, I tried to look this morning i'm like i can't even count i don't even i i stopped at like 200 million so i don't even know but you know regardless it still grabbed the national attention that week you ended up on the today show with uh matt lauer and yes. i don't know if it was still katie kirk at that time but you yeah you ended up on she the number one program there. on television yes what? I was. That what is, were you expecting when you went on there? For two or three days, my family and I, we stayed in California just touring the coast. So we hadn't been watching the television. We had no idea that people were making a big deal. And whenever we got home back to South Carolina, that's when it, our voicemail was completely full with people calling us wanting to do interviews. And finally, our pageant, my pageant director, Paula Miles, got a hold of me saying how the Today Show wanted to fly me up immediately uh, for the interview and Donald Trump wanted to meet me. And I was like, 
okay, we literally <laughs> just landed from California, and I'm getting on a flight in three hours. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And, and, you know, I'm 17 years old. I'm like, whoa, Donald Trump wants to meet me, and I get to go on the Today Show? All right. <laughs> so, kind of not really understanding. I just assumed because I made top five, they just thought I was awesome. So, I'm going to go on the Today Show, you know, and I get to meet Donald Trump. And I walk into the studio the next morning at like 6.30 a.m., I believe it was, and I see my face on all the TVs, and I'm like, holy cow, like, and it was my question, and I was like, is this really what, what is happening right now? <laughs> like, like, this is ridiculously awesome at the same time. <laughs> well, it's cool that you got to do that, um, you know, regardless of the circumstances that you got to do it under. Yeah. And I, I think most people that, you know, because of the pop culture icon in pageantry that you have become because of it, you know, a lot of people might look back at that and be like, oh, my God, did that ruin her life? And obviously it hasn't. But all that being said, before we even get into all the stuff that came from it, I, I really want to know, in your mind, how did you overcome all the scrutiny? Because, I, I mean, every, a lot of pageant girls deal with scrutiny and, you know, being hated upon mm-hmm. or whatnot. But, I mean, this is at a, a level that no other pageant competitor has ever dealt with in their entire lives. How did you deal with it? Because I think a lot mm-hmm. of girls could take some wisdom from what you're probably going to tell me. So, dealing with that, like, I, like I'm, I'm joking around and I'm, like, having fun with the the answers that I'm giving you now, you know, but I'm not going to lie. It was very hard. And there was a time period where I kept a lot of what I felt buried inside of me. And I did go to a dark place. And there were moments where I contemplated suicide. And I've spoken about that before in other interviews. And uh, it took me years to be able to get that out. And I remember the interview that I did, I think it was for 2020 or somebody, I can't remember exactly who it was, when I finally spoke about it for the first time, that that is something that definitely crossed my mind. And uh, it just broke me down because it felt like such a relief to uh, express that to the world because uh, what I went through wasn't okay. And the way I was being treated wasn't okay. And it, that's not the way that anybody should ever deserve to be treated, no matter what happens, no matter what they do, you know, and, um, they, like I was being cyber bullied and in college I was being co- bullied as well. I would be walking to class and people would uh, yell out to me some horrific words and phrases that I didn't deserve. And I had no idea who they were. And it was just an everyday thing. And uh, it got to a point to where it did start getting in my head. And that's what ultimately put me in that dark place. And there were some relationships that I was involved in, um, with males who, uh, were almost jealous of my fame or my name and they didn't necessarily comfort me or make me feel better. They made me feel worse. And it took a lot of strength to realize what I was going through within myself to be able to get back to a lighter, happier place. And over time, I gradually would change my friends and my friend group changed and it got smaller. The relationships I formed with people significant others and friends in general, I would start contemplating to see whether or not this person is being real. And it almost made me more wise. And it helped me find myself, even though what I went through the past couple of years, which I'm sure we'll probably get to with my ex-husband, that really helped me find myself. But it definitely, it, it's taken this entire time, these entire 12 years, I feel like I've always had a little bit of a, a burden in me that I've always held on to because I didn't know how to let go because I didn't love myself anymore because of the way I was treated. And it's taken this long to be able to find myself and to love myself again. And now my closet's full of color and not black and white anymore. Well, I, love to hear that. <laughs> I love to hear that. Now, now, it it sounds like one of your biggest coping me- mechanisms was changing the, the group of people that you were hanging out with. Obviously, exactly. people who build you up and don't tear you down. Was there a specific Perfect. moment? Because, look, I mean, when you get to a dark place and suicide, you know, filters into your thoughts. I mean, there had to be a, a rescuing moment where you said, no, <clears throat> I'm not I'm not going this route. I'm not doing this. Was it a person 
or was it a, 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 an experience or a circumstance that happened where it rescued you from that place? It was almost an experience, not necessarily a person, because I couldn't, I didn't know who to trust. There were even moments where I didn't even feel like I could even trust my own family, and I, like, even though I should have. And they were the ones that were constantly there for me and right for me. But it was it was hard to listen and to talk to people because I didn't even know how to listen and talk to myself about it for a long period of time. And so it was more of just a recognizing moment. And it was like, what am I doing? Like, I've always been a fighter. And just how I stated earlier, how I've always been an athlete. I've always been a big tomboy. I've always fought to win and to prove people wrong and to prove a point. And uh, there was just something that clicked in me the night that I was contemplating the suicide the most. And it just like hit me like, what am I doing? What are you doing? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, no, like get your, get your SHIT together. You're, you're going to continue to fight for this. And you know what? It's going to be a freaking B-I-T-C-H, but you're going to do it anyways. And you're going to keep fighting. And, and I had tears rolling down my face and I was hot. I was cold. I was pacing. I remember, and uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and this might sound silly to some people, but to me, I, I heard a voice. I felt a presence. I felt something empowering inside of me to continue on my life and to continue down the path of just fighting and to not give up. Well, look, I love, number one, the word fighter, because that's exactly what you are. I love your resilience, and you have obviously you. taken something that has been incredibly tough in life to handle and turned it into a positive. Now, so let's talk about that transition on, on kind of how and when that happened. So you were starting mm-hmm. to, to get gigs and people were inviting you on shows. Now, some of them were doing oh, it, yeah. you know, as a, as a joke, you know, like, oh, let's have the pageant girl on to answer, you know, stupid questions yeah. or whatever. Uh, I guess at what point did you find a career path in entertainment from this experience? The point that I found a career path was when Jimmy Kimmel hired me as the first outsider um, to be on his show. Originally, he had only hired people from his family or who are related to his family in some way or another to be on his show. And he was one of the comedians that made fun of me, but he wanted to bring me on genuinely as a an individual who can prove that she is an an unintelligent human being, that she is intelligent. And that's ultimately where the learning stuff with Katie Epton came from. I was working with him for about a year, year and a half, his correspondent, and we would film an episode a week and it would air every Thursday. And it was learning stuff with Katie Epton and it was a five minute segment for his show. And that is what made me want to continue down the path of entertainment and to be a host and to grow my career as a television host and as a correspondent for future celebrities and other shows like Chelsea Lately and Daniel Tosh and Rob Dyrdek and all that, obviously owning, doing my own thing too. And so that's, that's where that began. Now, you mentioned earlier that when you went to the Today Show, uh, Donald Trump wanted to meet you as well. I believe you ended up Correct. signing a, some sort of modeling deal with his agency in New York City. That is right. Uh, yeah, talk about, uh, talk about, I guess, meeting him and just kind of the relationship and how he evolved, <laughs> because he's obviously now president. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, Donald Trump is one of the coolest guys I've ever met in my life. He is... Uh, hilarious and (laughs) i'm sorry for all of you out there who hate him so please don't judge me okay (laughs) this is just my own experience with him so please understand that um but i got to go to his office in the trump tower and it was just him and i and he was welcoming with open arms super kind he actually called his wife on the phone and was like don't worry honey he's she's young for me joking around obviously (laughs) (laughs) so you guys like (laughs) like you can take a joke come on now (laughs) um but no he was so nice and so reassuring and so positive about everything and he was so happy to have met me and I was just like honored to even be in his presence and he saw a lot of potential in me a lot of growth in me and he wanted me to meet his modeling agency and their crew and he wanted the best people to take care of me because he really believed in me and my path of success from everything that had happened because he's definitely wanted to turn negative into a positive for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would say he's done that pretty well, wouldn't you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, one of the gigs that I know you really enjoyed over the uh, the past few years, uh, a show you did with Rob Deerdeck. Um, talk about how that yeah. partnership materialized. Oh, I love Rob. He's so awesome. Well, that obviously came after my career working with Jimmy Kimmel and Daniel and Chelsea for a little while. Once I started building that career, 
in the hosting world that Rob got a hold of me and wanted me to come on as his uh, as uh, Chanel. Um, co- like replacement co-host whenever she wasn't in town. And when him and I got to build a great relationship, he eventually was able to come on to my show. And he's one of the nicest, most real down there guys. Like there are people that will sometimes come off the street and come into his warehouse pitching a deal. And he'll be like, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. Let's try it. And it ends up working out. <clears throat> he's such an entrepreneur. Uh, what a great experience to have had. Like I had a lot of growth there, especially when it came to the improv side of hosting. I was able to learn a lot about myself and uh, uh, grow my hosting career in that standpoint in the comedic world and improv world. Now, speaking of comedians, uh, Tosh.0 has you on. (laughs) And I I think I found the video this morning. It was the two of you walking down the street with South Carolina banners on. (laughs) (laughs) Talk about that experience because he's he's, uh, he's hilarious. I was on one of his very first episodes. I, I was on one of his very first episodes in 2009. I was one of his first guests on his first season. It was awesome. He was a, he was the real deal. He took everything very seriously. When I went into his office, he had his boardroom of writers, and uh, they would pitch all these ideas, and he would shut it down immediately if he didn't agree. Like he was very involved with everything and takes his job very seriously. And he's just as funny on the outside as he is on television, too. Like, he's real deal. We did the little cinnamon challenge where you put, like, a tablespoon of cinnamon in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and and we just do? did that, like, with each other, like, behind the scenes. Like, you know, like, I don't even think anybody was filming it. We were just, like, uh, being funny and joking around. Um, I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a little disappointed in myself because I like to win. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I guess but it, was, the, it was just very entertaining. Of all the hosting gigs that you've gotten since that point, what mm-hmm. was what was your favorite? I guess. Oh man, uh, you know, they were all different, so they're all kind of my favorite in their own individual way. But I guess I'd have to say my ultimate favorite would be working on Fox's Back Nine Network um, as the lead host and it being more my show and me being able to control more of the scenarios and have more involvement with the guests that I bring on and that I got to talk to. That was really, really cool experience and super fun. And we got to play games with them. I mean, we filmed over 400 something episodes. So oh, wow. it, was, it was, yeah, it was a lot. And uh, every single person was different. Every single day was different. And it was just such a really cool, unique experience to have like your own show pretty much for a huge network like that. So when we talk about hosting, mm-hmm. the, the, as you well know, the hosting world is, it's one of two types. You either have a, a gig here and there. It's kind of more like part-time income. Correct versus mm-hmm. I'm a full-time I'm a full-time working host which in many cases you have been I guess did you yeah. have a literally a full-time hosting career for years uh, for about a year year and for about a year or two for the Fox's back nine network mm-hmm. unfortunately uh, because I was one of the newer shows uh, they ended up having to cancel some of the newer ones because there was uh, a lawsuit going on uh, with one of the former CEOs who was fired for sexual harassment. <laughs> so I fortunately didn't get to meet him. I was brought on a month after he was let go, but I guess that put the network into a multi-million dollar lawsuit and they weren't able to afford some of the show. So they had to cancel a couple of the newer ones and we were actually about to be nominated for an Emmy. So I wish it had turned out where we could have been nominated and then they canceled or something like that. But, you know, life goes wrong and uh, things happen and that are out of your control. But that that was probably the longest uh, hosting position that I've had to date. Well, one of the other uh, television aspects I want to talk about uh, that you were part of and actually a, a very big part of was the Amazing Race. I think it was Amazing Race 16. You finished third. Um, that, you Third know, place. especially back then was an, it was a very big show and it was well known for having pageant contestants on and, and you did really well. Talk about that experience. Oh man. Yeah. So I was season 16 on the amazing race and placed third place. And I was the last girl standing, which was awesome. It ended up being one of the seasons that was filmed the longest. Uh, there was a couple other seasons that were filmed just as long as us, I believe. But uh, we filmed for almost a month and a half, which usually they film for three weeks. Uh, you would never know that by watching the show. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't. Uh, I know they film a lot shorter in time frame now, but back then they were kind of experimenting and playing around. But it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I lost 
twelve pounds on the show. There in a month were and a half. literally wow. in, a, in a month and a half. There are literally days that I would go not seeing a single other team or film crew. And we would have no idea if we were in there even in the right country or right city. We we're like, this place is blah, 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 blah. Like, I can't even pronounce that, but I hope this is right. <laughs> like, <laughs> because so many of the countries, they don't speak English. It was very difficult to get around. So you had to trust in these strangers in these other countries that you don't know whether or not like you or not. And all you have are you, your partner, and your two camera crews. And it, during that time period where you're going around and you're not seeing a single other team, it gets scary. Very, very scary, very, very quickly. But when, what a rewarding experience to have. Like, I would totally do it over again. And uh, it just being able to go to all these different countries and experience all the different cultures, it was such a rewarding experience. Yes, I cried at the end because I was so happy that it was over because it was exhausting. <laughs> but it was all happy tears. <laughs> did you get anything as a result of Amazing Race? I mean, did, get, did more gigs yes. come because of it? Yeah. Yes, we did. We got a money prize and also, too, winning a couple of the legs. Each person who wins that leg of the race at the pit stop wins a prize as well. It could be money. It could be a product. It could be a, a, a trip. We ended up winning a trip uh, to Spain as one of the ones that we won. Oh, wow. Okay. Very good. Aside from television, um, we, we talked earlier about you know Donald Trump's modeling agency bringing you in. Now, you mm-hmm. modeled in advertisements for some pretty big names in magazines. Uh, Wrangler, Carl's yeah. Jr., Abercrombie, Verizon, People, Maxim, Seventeen, Cosmo. I mean, these are big, <laughs> big names. And every girl out there is yeah. listening going, God, how do I get those? Uh, was that through Trump's <laughs> agency that you got those or, or were those uh, separate? Some of them were through Trump. Some of them were through my manager who manages my modeling agencies. Um, I'm also signed with WME and IMG, uh, so some of those are through them, and NTA out here in Los Angeles, California. Most, of, uh, most, if not all, of my commercial jobs were through NTA because they're a commercial agency. So that's where the Carl's Jr. comes into play, Verizon, all of those. So, But for the most part, my TV hosting and uh, my print jobs all went through the print agencies and my hosting agent, WME IMG. So we're now, uh, I guess, going on 13 years here removed from the, the question. Uh, do you still get <laughs> interest from people for jobs because of it? I actually got an interest from a big company out in Sydney, Australia this year wanting me to fly there for a month and film. And it related it to the Miss South Carolina Teen USA spoof. <laughs> 13 years later. That's insane. Yep. <laughs> I did do a Delta commercial a couple years ago uh, because it was YouTube's like 10 year anniversary or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, they used me and my pageant thing um, for the Delta commercial. So that was really cool seeing myself when I would fly Delta. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, I guess let's talk about, uh, you know, a lot of the other stuff that you're doing today, because, you know, some of it is wor- worn off. I mean, it's not as prominent as it used to be in doing hosting gigs right. and entertainment and everything. Um, you ventured into, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the F-45 training facility in Culver City. Um, talk about what you've been doing with that and kind of where you expect to go. So after I, I lost my hosting position for my show that was in Connecticut for Fox's Back Nine Network, I moved back to California. And uh, I worked with my best guy friend out here who helped open the very first F-45 training um, location in California. And it was the third location in the country at the time. And that was in Santa Monica. So it was F-45 training Santa Monica. And I ended up loving it so much being the athlete that I am. I wanted to open up my own location because of how impactful I was able to be on other people's lives and uh, changing their lives and helping them better themselves. It really, really made me feel good. And it helped me. And I think it's actually played a big part in helping me find myself again, to be honest. Not going to lie, though, it has been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, becoming uh, one of the youngest owners in the world uh, for the franchise in general was absolutely rewarding, but stressful <laughs> at the same time, because a lot of people had a lot of, they expected a lot from me, um, and they wanted to see where I was going to go with it. And uh, we, I've had such great support from the franchise owners and uh, from the actual founders of the franchise 
They came to support my grand opening back when I was 27. I'm 30 now, for those of you who do not know. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> doing the math. And, yeah, just do the math for you guys. So that was absolutely awesome. But not going to lie, like I said, hardest thing I've ever done. I would wait, be up at 3, 4 in the morning every day, seven days a week, not be able to go to back to bed till 11 o'clock at night because I was at my gym. I was helping these people change their lives. And I was really, really putting all my heartfelt focus into them. So do you want to, do you want to do something else? Right now in the process of selling my share for the company, because uh, I'm in the middle of having a baby. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> like this week, <laughs> right? You. You're like, you're, you're literally like ready literally to pop. in four or five days. I'm having my first child and it's a boy. <laughs> well, I'm honored that you would be on the and podcast that, that close to having a baby. I know. I'm so excited. We're so excited. <laughs> and because of how stressful the gym business can be, um, I decided to go ahead and uh, put in my share uh, for sale. So I'm in the process of selling it right now, which is so exciting, but also sad at the same time. Everybody's really sad to see me go, but I don't think I'm going to be gone for too long because uh, my boyfriend and I, we were both talking about opening up a new location, potentially back in South Carolina. Oh, wow. So you could be seeing me back home very soon. <laughs> well, we certainly want you to come by the pageant and visit us, okay? Oh, of course. Well, I wanted to come this year, but obviously I'm a little pregnant, so can I do that? I know. Well, you and I obviously uh, we were in Alabama a couple of years ago together when you judged there. Yes. So, uh, you know, it's always that fun having so you fun. around. Yeah, we had a good time. Um, I, there was something you had mentioned kind of at the beginning. I, I kind of mm-hmm. I, I know you wanted to talk about it a little bit, and that you know we were talking about you know dealing with um, you know how you changed your life and, and move things around so you you know were able to come out of a dark place. Um, and one of those things was you know you were with somebody who obviously wasn't mm-hmm. really supportive of you, and it was it was hurtful. And I've talked to a lot of women in the pageantry world who have boyfriends um, who are kind of like that. I mean, they're not real supportive. Mm -hmm. They're almost degrading sometimes in the way they talk to them. How did you go about handling moving on, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. Um, Unfortunately, my ex-husband, the most recent one, was, I hate to say it, but the combination of all of my exes together and not in a good way. Um, It was actually a very terrifying experience. He was unstable and uh, he got to the point to where he was admitted to a mental ward and was diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And there was a time where I didn't think that I would live to see the next day. And uh, whenever I finally was able to recognize what I was putting myself through and that I couldn't help this poor soul anymore, I finally was able to talk about it to certain people. And they were like, okay, this is what you need to do. Like, we need to help you. You need to help yourself. And it just clicked in me that I needed to get myself out of that situation as fast as possible before I'm no longer on this earth because of him. You guys, like, if you're going through any kind of trouble like that with any human being, male or female, like, really hone in on the feelings that you feel, those negative feelings, and you're thinking, like, oh, well, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Most likely it's not, and you need to be very careful, and you need to find somebody to talk to, whether it's the police or uh, somebody you feel comfortable with or somebody who's been through it. You can even reach out to me. Even I will respond to anybody, even if I don't know you, um, if you have any problems or questions about stuff like that, because I'm very blessed to be on this earth today and to be able to say that I am happy in a new relationship and about to have a baby with an amazing man who genuinely loves and appreciates me for me, finally. Well, um, before we kind of wrap up here and, and get to our get-to-know Katie questions, uh, I, I guess as we kind of you know wrap a bow around this thing, for everybody listening, um, what kind of advice would you have for those who are in the pageant world as a teen? Because you obviously dealt with your issues as a teen. Um, yeah. And they're, you know, they're thinking, God, I don't want to end up doing that on a stage. What, what should I do? I mean, g- give some advice to everybody listening, if you would. So uh, some great advice that I would love to give out that actually really helped me in my hosting career after the fact. Um, was that advice that this, this one woman, she told me, focus on yourself. Don't focus on the people around you. Don't focus that on what they're wearing, what they're saying. Just tune it out. Focus on you, what you're there for, what your goal is, and what you want for yourself. And the second that I started putting that into my mind every single day for every single audition, I had to go into auditions 
in front of hundreds of uh, people and producers. And I would be terrified in the beginning, but once I kept telling myself to focus on myself and to focus on what you're there for and to not let it scare me, to, to tell myself that I have control over the situation, that they're the ones who want me, that you're, they're the ones who want you, you know? So if uh, you show your best version of yourself, you got the job. You're hired. You're going to win. That crown will be on your head. So focus on you. Stay true to you and breathe. It will calm you down. Trust me. That was really good. Okay, cool. All right. You ready for a get to know Katie questions? I got 10 of them. It's kind of game show style. You've done this plenty on all the shows that you've been on. So this should be super easy for you. I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Number one, how many hours of sleep do you need a night? Oh, is that before the gym or after the gym? <laughs> how, about, how about after? After the gym? Um, I need I need eight. Eight hours. Eight hours pretty common. Okay. Number two, do you believe in love at first sight? I believe in love at first sight. Number three, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? Zero to one. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Number four. What's the maximum number of spritzes of perfume before it's too much? Three. Number five, favorite place you've ever visited? Oh, Seychelles Island. I have heard that from multiple people. Seychelles is like eating. Oh, take your honey there. Oh, my gosh. Whenever the kids get a little older, you know, you got to take her there. There are some amazing views, I tell you. Okay, Seychelles. All right, number six, the last song you downloaded or listened to? Oh, Lordy Minority. Um, <laughs> I'm so bad <laughs> at naming the song. Um, 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 shoot, 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 what is it? it, it it's a new song. It's called When I Look at You, Your Face by... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You're, you're cranking it out there. Yeah, when I look into your face. Okay. Uh, <laughs> With Pharrell. Pharrell by Pharrell Williams. Pharrell. Okay, I'll look it up. All right. Uh, <laughs> number seven. I don't know. You might have had to do this before. What's something that you could eat for a week straight? Sushi. <laughs> Easily. Okay. Number eight. What's your favorite clothing brand? Ooh. <laughs> Sabo skirt. Which one? Sabo skirt, S A B O. I haven't heard of that one. Okay, I'll have to look that one up. Number nine. <laughs> who inspires Katie Upton? Ooh, somebody who inspires me. Probably Charlie Theron. Do you know her? I don't personally know her, no. But I follow her, and I follow. I watch a lot of her interviews. And, um, she's she is a very strong, and powerful, impactful woman, and I really look up to her. Always have. Charlie's there. Number 10, last one. Here we go. Who was your first celebrity crush? Ooh, Josh Hamill. He still is. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's not married to Fergie anymore, is he? I don't think so. Who knows with those celebrity tabs? <laughs> I know. They're kind of crazy. Well, hey, you're off the hook, number one. Great job. Thanks for answering those. Thank you. <laughs> number two, um, I, I just honestly want to tell you how impressed I am that you're still able to handle this and talk about it. I mean, I, I think everybody listening is probably shocked at the detail you went into in talking about it, but I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to share the experience and, and what you dealt with and how you've overcome it. So thank you. Oh, of course. Anytime. I know a lot of people keep a, a lot of stuff to themselves, me being one of them. And so I know how it is. And I know that there are people out there who are doing the same. And I just hope that I can at least impact at least one person's life to be able to talk about it and you know whether it is if they are contemplating suicide or if they're in a really bad relationship you know i just hope that i inspire them to get themselves out of it congratulations on your baby again i know you're ready to pop here in a couple of days so good luck uh -huh. with uh, the whole process Thank and uh, i'll certainly be paying attention on social media and uh, when when things kind of calm down <laughs> for you why don't you reach out to me again and we'll catch up okay i would love that that'd be awesome thank you so much Tim. It was so good talking to you give your wifey a big hug for me I definitely will, and we look forward to seeing you in South Carolina. Yes, sir. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to today's episode, everybody, and to Katie Upton for her time. Now, if you want to follow Katie on social media, you can check out her Instagram page. It's at Katie Upton, but it's not the normal Katie spelling, and I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. It's at C-A-I-T-E-U-P-T-O-N. That's Katie Upton.
Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast. You can do so on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, the podcast app, Google Play, or you can just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram at Tim T. Aldo. Until next time, remember the words of Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. If you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Have an awesome week, everybody.